previously on Band. You joined us on a trip back to 2009 where double diffusers were all the rage and became pivotal to the tech development race. But once they were banned, attention switched to another development, the Blown Diffuser. The Blown Diffuser was not a new concept by any stretch of the imagination as many cars throughout the 1980s and early 90s had harnessed the exhaust gases to provide an aerodynamic boost. The major difference though was that these earlier attempts were crude interpretations with the tailpipe of the exhaust fed right into the diffuser, making life extremely difficult for the driver. The driver's inputs on the throttle controlled the amount of downforce available as more throttle meant more exhaust gas. This meant that many drivers had to try and adapt their driving style to suit, sometimes counterintuitively getting on and off the power accordingly, depending on the scenario. The practice fell out of favour when diffusers were cut back in the 1990s, but Adrian knew he was more than happy to rekindle a solution from the past, moving the exhaust tailpipes down towards the floor, and rather than blowing into the diffuser, they'd now blow the sides of it. Knowing others would be quick to see its potential, Red Bull even attempted to disguise its intentions when it first tested the solution, placing stickers on the bodywork in the old exhaust position to throw others off the scent. But Formula 1 engineers certainly aren't stupid, and as expected it wasn't long before others caught wind and began to copy the solution, as they quickly realised the aerodynamic benefits that having their exhaust tailpipes in similar positions would have. Red Bull held a considerable advantage over their competitors though, as they had a head start on an incredibly important aspect of making the blown diffuser a potent aerodynamic tool. Working closely with Renault, they'd been able to design engine maps that meant the exhaust gases would be pumped out of the engine even as the driver trailed off the throttle. Just like that, the past issues with blown diffusers was gone and downforce was still being created when the driver was braking and driving into the apex. The FIA sought to discourage this entire practice, moving to change the regulations about the location of the exhaust for 2011. However, they failed pretty spectacularly, as no fewer than three different designs immediately emerged to try and counteract those rules, and regain the performance that was originally thought lost. The two most extreme solutions to arrive were from McLaren and Lotus, as they torturously rooted the exhaust within the side pod to try and place the tailpipe in a position where they thought they'd gain the most aerodynamically. In the case of McLaren, its fantail solution had a nozzle that was mated to the floor and blew through a long slot along the edge. It was supposed to act in much the same way as a skirt, creating a seal between the floor and the track. But not all good ideas work in practice though, and this one didn't even make it through testing, as the team struggled with heat management issues and the rigidity of the exhaust over the flexibility of the floor. Over at Lotus, they'd opted to stretch the exhaust outlet all the way to the front of the floor. Their forward-facing exhaust solution had shown promise when tested against other designs, and also proved less susceptible to changes in throttle, resulting in an easier car to drive. Meanwhile, Red Bull had come up with a solution that was swiftly followed by the rest of the grid. It created wide, low exhaust that sat on top of the floor and exited into the channel between the side of the tyre and the outer diffuser wall. This solution would help to mitigate a problem known as tyre squirt, which sees jets of air push laterally into the diffuser's path as the tyre is squashed under load. It must not be underestimated just how large a role Renault played in the project, as Red Bull continued to refine and exploit the physical design of the exhaust, while Renault helped to create maps that made the engine act like an air pump when off throttle. Following the changes in the 2012 regulations, where blown diffusers were inadvertently banned due to the regulations where exhaust outlets could be placed, Teams were forced to think outside the box, as they weren't prepared to give up the performance they'd found. Enter the Coanda Effect When F1 wanted to remove the blown diffusers, the technical working group, comprising of the bigger team's technical chiefs, had to work out how to stop it. But both Red Bull, represented by Paul Monaghan, and McLaren, represented by Paddy Lowe, had both experienced an effect in the wind tunnel in which the exhaust gases were drawn along the bodywork of the car. So in those meetings, the two, having considered that a benefit, surreptitiously began to text each other during the phone conferences in order to manoeuvre the regulations to their liking. The eventual bounds that the FIA settled on suited them perfectly, giving both Red Bull and McLaren a head start in bringing the Coanda effect into play. McLaren's solution was the most widely adopted for 2012, extending the rear of the side pods outwards to help the exhaust plume produce the Coanda effect. The jet of exhaust gas expelled from the engine pulled nearby airflow towards it, ensuring that it took the right path to the gap between the tyre's side wall and the diffuser's outer wall, just as it was with the exhaust blown diffuser solutions used in 2011. 
The critical thinking behind the design with the McLaren solution was that with the exhaust mounted in a pod that overhung the side pod, airflow would still flow around the side pod and into the coke bottle region. This was a key issue that the users of the ramp solution such as Sauber had to wrestle with. The exhaust gases would mix with the flow ordinarily destined for the coke bottle region, diluting the effect of both. Red Bull however wanted a solution that brought the best of both worlds. This was a more complex prospect and needed a tunnel to help the two effects cross over. This would not come without its complications though as the team grappled with trying to make it work in the real world after simulations offered some promising potential. Red Bull was convinced that it was onto something special and it actually ran a benign exhaust solution through the course of pre-season, mainly in an attempt to delay anyone being able to copy its arrangement. It finally unveiled its crossover ramp solution on the penultimate day of testing, but Julie came up against issues as it suddenly found that it had flow instability with the tunnel that made the car inconsistent on turn-in. But still, the team continued its development. The regulatory changes for 2012 not only had an impact on the position of the exhaust, but also the surrounding bodywork. As such, many of the teams seen up and down the grid that used the Coanda Star solution had bodywork with a trough-like appearance. This was bounded by the new regulations and most opted for a simple letterbox style trough. Meanwhile, Red Bull continued to develop, now with a renewed effort being made to reshape the crossover tunnel's entrance, in order to smooth the passage of airflow into the tunnel and beyond. This meant a total redesign of the side pod, including the movement of the exhaust tailpipe. There was also a lengthening of the tunnel, the shape of the tunnel's entrance being enlarged, and a vertical separating slot mounted within. At this point, it appeared that the team had finally got on top of its aerodynamic instability issues, and the car behaved more predictably meaning it could now hunt for extra performance. This would come from a continued push to refine the crossover tunnels and bodywork that surrounded the exhaust shape, and a renewed effort by Renault to find ways to stabilise the exhaust flow. Meanwhile, the team had worked out that the plume created by the exhaust shape, itself mandated by the new regulations, was having a detrimental effect. In order to soften a damaging vortex that was being formed, it worked on using a Heimholtz resonance chamber, a noise control device that absorbs any excess energy to minimise the amount of drone inside. Doing that, Red Bull was able to essentially damp the exhaust, to create a more even distribution of exhaust gases. The amount of work done by Red Bull during 2012 to make the solution work was monumental, but that's not to say the others on the grid were resting on their laurels either. Sauber, who started with the ramped solution, switched to a McLaren-S Coanda solution during the season instead, while Ferrari remained an outlier throughout the early phases of 2012. The team preferred to try and modify its Acer duct solution on an ad hoc basis, while it worked out the best way to maximise the Coanda solution. The FIA let the use of these Coanda style exhausts slide for 2013, knowing the financial burden that the teams had gone through to develop them, with even more advanced versions appearing through the season. They were also aware that with the new hybrid rules coming into play for 2014, the ability to blow the diffuser with the exhaust would just simply no longer be viable. So while the Coanda exhausts were never outright banned, the regulations were actually changed to account for it, as the exhausts would now have to enter through the car's centreline going forward. And that's about it for our two-part roundup of the diffuser arms race that took place from 2009 all the way up until 2014, with the introduction of the hybrid era spoiling all of our Coanda fun. What are your thoughts on the window of time? Do you think the various diffuser concepts were ingenious and should still be used to this day? Or do you think the FIA should have banned them before they were even born. And what other banned F1 innovations do you want to see us look into next? Let us know in the comments below.